Hi, and welcome to the Welsh History Podcast. Before we begin, I just wanted to mention that Distractions Media, which is the, kind of the parent company to Welsh History Podcast, is celebrating its fifth year uh, as a company. And as part of that, we're having celebrations which are going on across our various media partners. Um, in fact, last weekend, we published an episode that was like a fifth anniversary look back on our Dungeons and Distractions podcast feed. As well, we are going to have a live stream at the end of March on the 30th to celebrate with our followers, fans, and and those that are a part of the group. And uh, if you want to check that out, you can check it out at twitch.tv forward slash distractions media. All right, let's get to the show, shall we? Episode 99, A King of England and a Princess of Wales. The 1270s brought a lot of new experiences for both Edward and Llewellyn. Edward, in 1270, went on crusade, arriving first at Tunis in 1271, only to find that the war there had ended. Part of the reason why he was brought over is because the king of France wanted his help to defeat an enemy there. But by the time they arrived, uh, there had already signed a peace treaty, in effect. Um... He then left his French allies and went on to the Middle East and then carried out a series of battles which lasted pretty much for the entire year of 1271. And then he would spend into 1272 in the area around the Crusader Kingdom of Acre. Um, The Crusades at this point were already failing badly, and his crusade is either looked at as a part of the Eighth Crusade or possibly as a Ninth Crusade, depending on which person looks at it and views it. Uh, They were basically, at this point, a bad failure, which, in effect, accomplished very little. And in 20 years, the entire enterprise collapsed, and the Crusader Kingdom itself collapsed. While it's outside of our podcast, it's important to note that Edward is gone during this period as tensions continue to fester between Llewellyn and the Marcher Lords. Basically, he's gone from 1270 to 1274, so for quite a long period of time, and as we'll find out, a very important time for the prince. As mentioned in the last couple of episodes, the economics of Wales and the aggressions of Llewellyn to expand his territorial control and the costs of the Treaty of Montgomery were working against the prince. Losing to the Duke of Gloucester had been the first major blow, because it gave Gilbert the time to build, rebuild and to show that Llewellyn was not unbeatable. Many to that point had seen the prince as consistently able to expand at the expense of others, because he was superior in martial skill. But now the marcher lords had seen him get a bloody nose trying to expand into Glamorgan, and so were looking to get some of their own back on him. What made the situation more difficult for Llewellyn was the health of King Henry, In 1270, with Edward leading on crusade under the leadership of the King of France, Henry also had talked about going, only to have to beg off due to health concerns. Henry at this point was 63 and had ruled almost since the time he could walk. He was made king at nine years old, so and at the death of his father John in 1216. Many have argued that his early accession did not prepare him for the rigors of rule, which might have been part of why he was such an ineffective and easily overthrown at times ruler. But he was a key figure in finally ending the Welsh War, and without him the Treaty of Montgomery would have struggled to ever be made. Made worse is that in November of 1272 he died. His death left England without a monarch, as the heir was at that point still on crusade, and would be busy in Italy after that for another two years. This left the monarchy in the hands of a group that were basically overseeing the governing of England at the time, including and led by Roger Mortimer. Mortimer, as we've mentioned before, was an enemy of Llewellyn's. Another marcher lord who effectively had fought against Llewellyn throughout the Welsh Wars, having him rather than Edward left the prince with little recourse as the marcher lords began to start to move to take land away from him. For the next nearly two years, Mortimer ruled in the favor of the lords over the prince, causing the response of one missive to follow with a bit of sarcasm in print. This is from Llewellyn to ostensibly the king. We received letters in your majesty's name, but we are sure that they did not have your consent, 
referring to Edward's absence while Mortimer ruled. He went further. If you were present in your kingdom, as we hope, such an order would not have been sent. The king was seen by the prince as a buffer from the lords, and without him they were difficult to hold back. I would suggest that Llewellyn likely had been trying to grab back all the areas in the south to place them under his own control and remove the marcher lords from Wales. Why else can sinew south into Kerfilly, only a few minutes from Cardiff? As we noted, the south was a key agricultural engine of Wales. The country had little arable land in the north of the valleys and of David. The lack of trade and wealth in the, this period, where agriculture dominated, left native-controlled Wales much poorer. While, yes, there were areas, especially like Anglesey, where there was growing of crops going on, compared to the rest of England and other areas, it certainly was not in the same degree or ability. And that, of course, is the main financial tool you have in your tool chest at this point it becomes very difficult to do much especially when you don't have a lot of market towns and in the native welsh case you didn't have hardly any of course because these areas were less mountainous and more hospitable to travel it left them easy to take militarily so thus castle building had stretched from the irish sea to the borders this meant that as Llewellyn tried to firm his territory, he too had to face a construction program, or would have to face the fact that his whole domain could be vulnerable to an assault. Obviously this cost in finances and work and taxes, or at least the equivalent of such, would have been extreme. We talked a bit about the problems Llewellyn had already had raising money last episode, including his massive tax increases in some instances. Well, this would compound his infrastructure issues with spending issues with what he owed to the English monarchy. For a comparison, Tuan could rely on £17 yearly from customs revenue across the native portions of Wales. A paltry sum by any measure, but as for comparison, during that same period, the King of England got £10,000 a year. The prince's entire income for the year was £6,000, and he had committed to play the English £3,000 yearly for a decade. This was not something sustainable, especially when one takes into account the arms race he was involved in, this castle-building program that he was dealing with. Llewellyn fell behind on his payments pretty quickly, as he made 1267, made 1268 and 1269, but then had to delay his payment in 1267 because he wasn't able to come up with the money and when he did pay it off paid it off in bits and bobs after that but after that 1270 he didn't pay again for the next three years of edward being away in fact the reality of the cost of rule and the mortgage he'd paid had been so dear that it was incredibly difficult for him and the peace treaty left llewellyn with little choice Part of the reason may be down to two years of failed harvest, putting pressure on the only saleable commodity that Llewellyn had access to at this point. Again, going back to the fact that their north and west Wales didn't have loads of port towns, didn't have towns at all, really. So there wasn't market towns that you could tax and trade that you could tax. The, the amount of income was so limited in comparison to the rest of England let's say, it makes it very difficult for Wales to, to financially survive in those circumstances, especially when you add these extra costs on top of it, including both an expanding military and an expanding debt that you owe the English government. Like most of us, Llewellyn did not want to admit that he was broke. Rather, he used political difficulties rather than the financial ones as the reason why he had not paid going so far as to claim that he would pay it all off if the kings would just fix things. This was likely a bluff, a way to achieve his goals, almost like when you tell your creditor you will have the money soon. Uh, in some ways, it feels like a mafia protection scheme. It would be terrible if something were to happen to you and this country of yours. Of course, this was a negotiated scheme, and the fact that the price had been set was beyond his ability to pay, may have, in fact, been the reason 
why it was in the back of Llewellyn's mind to justify himself under these circumstances. I mean, a treaty is a treaty, a treaty, until you break said treaty. And likely this was the driving reason why he was trying to expand. Whereas in previous years, he may have had the cash due to conquering and pillaging and just generally uh, a good season and good harvest. Now, all of a sudden, when you're desperate for funds, one of the ways that you can gain that is by capturing more land, especially arable land in the south. So it makes sense that he would be going after that. And of course, that would then create this conflict between him and the marcher lords, who at the same time are trying to grab land farther north and west, as the case may be. Though, one thing that might also explain this move is the fact that his lords were doing what they had done ever since the Saxons and the Britons first collided. Some wanted to break off their allegiance from the prince, and others, probably due to the large tax burden, were starting to grouse about his leadership and saying he was effectively too strong for them. As his lords started to balk at his power, the prince struggled to deal with the new king's regents. He felt aggrieved at their heavy-handed and duplicitous behavior around enforcing the treaty. So when in 1273, for example, the king's agents came to the ford to receive the fealty of Prince Llewellyn, he in effect stood them up. And all of this must have played into the hands of the marcher lords, while eventually angering Edward and creating unrest at home. Because, of course, all they have to do is tell Edward, hey, this guy just won't listen to us. You know, we treat him fairly and he's just not doing what we ask. And look, he won't even give you, the king, your proper homage. How dare he? And all of this would have combined to their advantage and make him look so much the worse because of it. So unrest over taxes, the handling of the new reality, and probably all of these combined with a general feeling of discouragement and disgruntlement probably led to some of the hard feelings that were coming along. And hard feelings turned into hard action in 1274 because at this point, David, his brother and at that point closest advisor, once again turned on him. It was claimed in 1274 that he led a plot with Griffith, Grenwinwin, and his son Owain to att basically to assassinate Llewellyn on February 2nd, 1274. The problem is it all kind of fell apart because Owain could not get to the council meeting in which he was supposed to attack Llewellyn because of a snow storm. Now, of course, he isn't initially caught or found out for quite some time. It takes a couple of weeks before Llewellyn realizes that something was amiss, and even then it takes several months before Owen admits to what had gone on. The chronicles claim that it was done under a confession he gave to the bishop, basically to clear his conscience, but there is a lot of circumstantial evidence that points to the fact that it was probably under some sem semblance of pressure, which was a little bit more forceful than what a bishop would have done, and admitted that both his father and David were responsible for this plot, and it would all come to a head in the uh, fall of uh, 1274. In the meantime, however, it the failure of this led eventually to all sorts of problems afterwards. As word got back to Edward that his father was dead, he made what academics call a rather leisurely return to England, arriving on August of 1274 to be crowned Edward I, King of England. By this stage, Llewellyn had already been at the breaking point with his new king and his supporters. The marcher lords, bolstered by Gloucester and the mild response of Mortimer, began to advance their own interests. Humphrey de Bowen, for example, began to make claims on the Breckens, while Llewellyn had obviously had domain over them. The claim being is that the prince might rule the land, but the castles were actually de Bowen's, so they belonged to him. Mortimer, after a lot of back-channel discussions with the marcher lords, came to the conclusion that that was an accurate interpretation of the treaty, which led Llewellyn to send off his snarky reply I mentioned above. In protest for all of this, ill will, likely because of his own internal issues keeping him close to home, Llewellyn skipped out on the coronation of Edward. 
Hardly an irreparable crime, but certainly not something you want on your ledger when trouble began. And on November 25th, 1274, Edward and Llewellyn were meant to finally meet face-to-face in Shrewsbury. Issues over the repayment would likely have featured in that discussion as well as the prince giving homage to the new king. Instead, Edward claimed to have fallen ill. There's no proof for or against this. We don't have any obvious evidence. We have some circumstantial evidence that suggests that Edward may have been kind of delaying because in one respect he could see that there was trouble back at home and was wondering if maybe Llewellyn would be reduced by his own government. And because of this, they never did meet. So effectively not giving homage to Edward had put it Llewellyn on the path to be considered a rebel. Meanwhile, David and Griffith fled to England in November of 1274, and it was seen by the prince as a number of example that the English were not to be trusted, and thus not deserving of that acknowledgement. So in other words, they were proving to each other why they didn't trust one another. However, as the year turned, Llewellyn began a different type of relationship. Simon de Montfort's daughter, Eleanor, was now in her 20s, and historians had long thought that before his death, de Montfort had set, as part of this alliance with Llewellyn, that they would have a marital partnership and a marital alliance to go with it, uh, helped, no doubt, by the fact that de Montfort was related to Henry, they would use that in the way that she is basically the niece of, at that time, the current king and cousin to Edward. Uh, In the medieval world, marriage was a political tool, as it was one that was used to strengthen ties between interests. We mentioned this before, certainly. But in this case, I'm left to wonder if there was something deeper going on here. Llewellyn, by this point, was 52 years old. He obviously not a spring chicken, and at that point had finally now decided to marry. Eleanor herself was 23. Obviously, women in this period didn't have a lot of say in what happened to them, but still, this agreement was with her father was 10 years ago, if it was with him. And even if her mother wanted it to go through, the de Montforts were not in any position, really, to demand much of anything. So... Was this a case of Llewellyn being smitten with the girl? Was there something going on outside of that? Would marrying into the de Montforts reduce as they were, give the prince an advantage of some sort? Or did he, as an older gentleman, find the girl attractive and just wanted to marry someone like that? We we obviously don't know the dealings that were going on here. Certainly the de Montforts were, up until the death of Simon, fairly successful. But by this point, they'd been kicked out of England. They were considered to be a family more or less in rebellion against the King of England. Their, her brothers had been taken part in an assassination of someone who was close to the king, which angered the king enough that he more or less banned any male member of the de Montforts from coming into England. So again, you have to question why. Now, I can understand the idea that at this point, Llewellyn would want to get married and want to have a family because now he's starting to realize as he ages that the descendancy of and the inheritance of Prince Apality was now dependent upon this. And so you can see why this would now suddenly become important to him. Um, However... If there was some sort of political advantage in that light, it backfired fairly quickly. Eleanor and Llewellyn were married by proxy in 1275. The arrangement was then set in place, likely in the spring of 1275, with uh, Llewellyn and Eleanor's mother. But by the time it had gone through, she was already passed away. After the king had allowed the co-conspirators to escape into England, uh, this time talking about David and uh, and Griffith, Llewellyn may have wanted to get some payback on Edward for that. So that may have been the other reason why he was doing this, specifically with that family. In some ways, it shows some arrogance on Llewellyn's part. And again, we'll never really know what the reasons are. We can't get into the mind of Llewellyn and actually 
or even ask him now. But, and of course, he didn't write anything, and anybody who would have had an opinion on it were already slanted in whatever way that they already believed. So no one really knows what the reasoning behind it all was. But Edward, for his own part, was never going to allow a de Montford man back into England, as I said before. And as Eleanor traveled to Wales, the English were on watch for the de Montforts. Earlier, Amare de Montford had tried to get back into the country under the protection of a fellow priest, only to be turned away. The fact that he was now charged to go to Wales with his younger sister likely did not make that better for him. And in fact, pirates from Bristol caught them near the island of Sicily. And there can be no doubt that Edward was on the lookout because these men were promptly paid for that work. The de Monfords had crossed the line with Edward and thus were never going to allow them back in, no matter what the reason was. And in Amory's case, he was held in prison for almost 10 years, whereas in the case of Eleanor, she was kept in what was considered a soft confinement, uh, probably kept quite well, but obviously not allowed to travel anywhere on her own. And because of that, was then held during the confrontation between Llewellyn and Edward in, that was to come. And the fact that Llewellyn had taken a de Montfort to wife was likely continue this downward relationship and certainly would have soured Edward's point of view on him if it wasn't already. And as much like what he did to Robert the Bruce's wife, he made sure that she was going to be imprisoned and kept away. And not only that, but he would use that capture as a tool against Llewellyn over the coming years. So thus, 1276 began on a terrible note for the prince, and it was about to get much worse. With that, I'd like to thank you for listening. Uh, if you would like to uh, follow what we do, you can do so at the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com. If you have any comments, you can uh, follow me on Twitter at Welsh History Pod or on my personal account at Linstead DM. Uh, you can also uh, reach out to us on Facebook. We're at facebook.com forward slash Welsh History Podcast. And of course, uh, we're on various places such as Spotify iTunes, all of those good things. And finally, uh, I would also encourage you to check out distractionsmedia.com. Anyway, until next time, everyone, take care. Bye-bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. And for everything we do, check out distractionsmedia.com. This is Peter. And this is Tom. We want to tell you guys a little bit about our podcast. Tom and I met in college, became best friends, and then teachers almost 20 years ago. Sometimes school just does not allow us to elaborate on the topics that we find interesting, like the real shark attacks that inspired the movie Jaws, or the real historical context to Indiana Jones artifacts. Where does cereal come from? Or are zombies real? Does Ben Franklin really deserve to be on a $100 bill? On our podcast, just like in our class, there are no stupid questions. Just two friends having a lighthearted conversation about history, pop culture, and the context of current events. Listen to History Teachers Talking Podcast from Evergreen Network, anywhere you get your podcasts.